Welcome to lecture 4H, Cache Coherence and Memory Consistency. Over the last few weeks, we understood the concept of how an instruction pipeline works and then we studied about memory hierarchy. We learned about cache memories and optimizations that are being done on these cache memories. The whole concept of our study till now were with a basic understanding that we have a processor and its associated levels of caches that is being connected to the processor. Now we know that we are into a multi-core era. At least the term multi-core would be familiar to you, but over the next few weeks, we will learn about what are the peculiarities of these multi-core processors. So now we are slowly thinking of considering a computing environment where you have multiple processors working together. So when you have multiple processors and then all these processors how to do execution and this execution is done by fetching instructions from their caches. Now how about these caches of them? What if these programs are going to run some programs that are cooperating each other wherein they have some shared data? So this week's video is completely planned. The lectures are designed in such a way that we will be able to appreciate how multi-threaded execution progresses with shared data. Let us now look into a typical case of a multiprocessor system. So one way that you can look at is, you can think of a scenario where you have multiple processors that is been given, they all can have a single shared L1 cache. So then they, you have to make sure that this particular cache should have access points, multiple access points that has been there. The other alternative that you can think of, it would be like this, where you have private L1 caches for each of these processors and then there is a shared bus that is connecting all of them and then probably your main memory is connected outside after that. So for multiple processors, obviously your cache has to be distributed because the processors are distributed small simple private L1 cache that is going to be the preference that we should be giving. Now these caches will actually give you parallel access and can we treat all these small individual caches act like one single big cache. So even though they all are individual caches, each one of them connected separately to these processors and imagine they are private caches also. Can we logically consider them as a single unit? So if you logically consider them as a single unit, anything that happens, there exists some consistency between them. Looking further deeper into it, consider an access to a memory location or a variable called an X. So if we have a single physical location for X, then there is no advantage of a distributed design. So think of a case that you are talking about an X and there will not be having any x in any of this, then there is nothing big about a distributed setup what we are talking. If you have multiple locations for storing the same variable x, let us say there is an x here, there is another x here, so every one of them will keep a local copy of some value x and then the replicas have to contain the same value. This is the challenge and this is known as the problem of coherence. So, even though these are all discrete memories that we are talking. Our aim is to consider as a single memory. The internal complication should be transparent and there can have multiple copies of the same variable and we need to have a mechanism by which the replicas should have the same value. So coherence means make a set of locations behave as if they are a single location. Let us now talk about sequential ordering. So here I am trying to introduce a concept wherein x and y are global variables and initially they are set to 0. Let us imagine Tx and Ty are local variables and they are stored into registers. Consider two threads, thread 1 and thread 2. Initially thread 1 is setting a value x equal to 1 and then y equal to 1. Thread 2 is copying this value of y into a variable called T1 or it can be register also and T2 is copying a value from X into the variable T2. So consider two threads. 
Imagine that instructions across the threads can execute in any order. So, now we are talking about through two threads and I have processor P1 and processor P2. Your thread 1 is going to run on processor P1 and your thread 2 is going to run on processor P2. So, when you have a setup like this, how are you going to ensure that this will give correct output? Now, the design question here is, is an outcome of T1 equal to 1 and T2 equal to 0, is it really possible? So, first of all, let us try to understand what is the meaning of these two threads. So, my value of x is put into 1 and the value of y is also being put into 1. So, then when thread 2 runs, imagine that thread 2 runs after thread 1 then already my x value equal to 1 and y value equal to 1. So, when you look in t1 value would be equal to 1 and t2 also will be equal to 1. So, ideally this is what you are going to see. Now, the other possibility is if there is a contact switching that is been happening x equal to 1 runs and then t1 equal to y. So, if you print the value of t1 initially since the value of y is equal to 0. So, t2 value will be equal to 0 and then you are going to run. So, t 1 value will be equal to 0 and t 2 value will be equal to 1. This is yet another possibility if the execution happens like this. Now, there is another possibility let us say thread 2 is going to run. So, initially x n value is 0. So, 0 0 is always possible, but never a case like t 1 equal to 1 and t 2 equal to 0 is it possible or not? In our normal thinking, it may be difficult. There exists no sequential ordering that gives t1 equal to 1 and t2 equal to 0. So, when do you have t1 equal to 1 and t2 equal to 0? Let us try to understand this particular case in a little more deeper analysis. Given the scenario of t1 equal to 1 and t2 equal to 0, that means this should be 0 and this should be 1. That means, you are talking about a scenario where y value has become 1, whereas x value is still at 0. So, initial value of x equal to 0, y equal to 0, then you make x equal to 1 and then y equal to 1. So, what happens is in the potential question that is being asked, you are telling y has become 1. As per the program sequence, if y has become 1, that means surely x equal to 1 is also executed. So, if you talk about a scenario t1 equal to 1 and t2 equal to 0, this means that the effect of x equal to 1 was not visible, whereas the effect of y equal to 1 is visible. Is it really possible that you have a scenario like that? Let us now take this case. Consider a scenario thread 1 sets the value of x equal to 1, that is you are going to store a value into x. So, you send an update into memory. So, processor will tell that x equal to 1. So, it has to be reflected in memory, but due to some problem in the memory queuing delay, something that you might have already learn in the cache memory, some kind of a problem that happened or else in the upcoming main memory sequence also you may see that. Imagine that processor from processor side processor told the value of x subs to be made to 1. Accordingly, signals have been sent into memory for the same. Imagine that thread 1 set y equal to 1 and this also you have sent an update to memory. Imagine this y happened in a place which is different from x. Maybe x and y may not be there in the same bank or they may be in different location. So, this did not get reflect whereas, this got reflected. So, now what happened thread 2 read x as 0 that is the initial value. So, when, when you perform t1 equal to y such a both have happened, but this was not reflected in the memory and t1 equal to y that will make us t1 equal to 1, t2 equal to x, see your x value is old, the updated value of x is not reached. So, thread 2 reads x as 0 and thread 2 reads y as 1 later. So, in this case, it is indeed really possible that you may get a sequence of t1 equal to 1 and t2 equal to 0. So, what you have seen from this example? We have given the case of two threads and from these threads, you are telling that there can be any order in which these threads can run because they are running in two different processors and this is a shared variable. One processor writes something which the other one has to get, it may be has to go through memory, we do not know how is the memory that is being modeled. 
if the effect of one of the write operation is not visible to the other processor, whereas effect of another write that happened after the first one that was visible to the processor, so there was no sequential ordering. So this is a clear case of violation of sequential ordering. Now let us see what do you mean by program outcome. Given a parallel program, what are the set of valid outcomes that a particular program can have? It depends on the system in which the program is running. It depends on the CPU and basically the pipeline in which the execution of the instructions are carried out, the memory model that you use, the main memory controller that you have and the interconnection between the memory levels. So, processor will perform some kind of a memory operation and eventually this operation has to be reflected into the memory hierarchy. Thereafter, if some other processor is going to use it or access it, it should be visible to them. So, the implementation of the CPU, basically your pipeline, the memory models and the interconnection system will have a say in which what are the set of valid outcomes that a particular program can have. So, every processor has a set of specifications that specify the allowed outcomes or behavior. So, given a program, it is expected that this is the expected behavior that the program has as far as the specifications are concerned. If the behavior of a program is consistent with the specification mentioned, then we tell that the execution is said to be consistent. So, given a set of specification that are part of a processor and then you tell that as per this specification, these outcomes or this behavior is expected as far as the processor is concerned and if the behavior is consistent, if the behavior of the program output is consistent with the specification that has been mentioned, then we tell that the execution of the program is consistent. Let us now move into memory consistency model. A memory consistency model is actually a policy which specifies the behavior of a parallel multi-threaded program. So, in general, a multi-threaded program can produce large number of outcomes depending on the relative order of scheduling of a thread. So, when you talk about multi-threaded, you have different threads are there. Now, some of these threads may run faster, some may be little slow, some may start late, some may start early. So, if you look at this, a multi-threaded program can produce large number of outputs or outcomes are possible for a program depending on the relative order of scheduling of these threads and the behavior of these memory operations. So, a memory consistency model which actually tells or restrict what it is going to restrict that only a set of allowed outcomes are possible for a given multi-threaded program. So, your consistency model tell this particular outcome is okay, this particular outcome is okay. So, it will define a set of possible outcomes that are accepted. Such a kind of a policy is known as memory consistency model. So, it is a set of rules that define the interaction of memory instructions between each other. Now, let me bring your attention to few important concepts here. I am going to talk about an observer sitting. This is a cache memory and I am going to observe this cache, what is happening in this cache. Imagine that you have a queue in which from the CPU, whatever is the request coming, they are going to be queued in here and one by one, they are going to be updated in the memory. So, if you look at a memory operation, it can have a start time. This may be defined at the time in which this particular request enters into a queue and it has an end time. End time is as far as the request is concerned, the operation get carried out in the cache memory and this entry is been removed. So, there is a time at which the entry will come and occupy itself inside a queue that is called the start time and then the actual operation of writing something into the memory location happens. So, the observer is now watching what is the completion time and then once the completion is been done, then this particular entry is been removed from the queue. So, as far as the processor is concerned, processor is going to perform a memory operation wherein you have a cache memory that you are talking and here we are going to bring in the context of an observer who looks into what is the order in which these events are happening. So, you are going to write x, you are going to write y, you are going to read the value of z like that all these operations will happen in some order. 
Now, for every operation, we define a start time, the time at which the entry enters queue, the end time, the time at which the entry is removed from the queue, and the completion time, the time at which the actual memory operation is being reflected in those the cache. So, we have seen that this cache memory is based upon an SRAM design. So, you have some cells, some flip flops. So, the moment the flip flops will change the value, that is called the completion time as far as the memory is being concerned. So, now you consider three requests R1, R2, and R3. So, for R1, we have starting time, we have ending time, and in between somewhere here, the value is completed. That is the completion time of the request. R2 spent little more time. So, it came without much delay. The actual memory update happened and thereafter it took some more time for this entry to be removed from the location. Similarly, for R3 you can see that the start time is there, the end time is there. So, typically in all these cases, the timeline of the memory request are seen by the observer. We always seen that the, com the completion time of the memory request is within the start time and the end time. So, generally we expect that the actual memory operation happens within the start and end. Now, let us try to understand when you talk about an execution, it consists of a sequence of operations that are ordered one by one. Now, what are these operations? These operations are carried out by some thread. So, we have a thread ID associated with this and then we have a starting time in which the operation is being recorded. In the previous case, we have seen it is associated with a queue and then it is an ending time and your memory operations can be read or write. It can be also known as load or a store operation. Now, in both kind of operations be it a load or it is a store there is an address that is been associated with these locations and if it is a store operation I have to mention let us say I have to store 10 then I have to mention the value if it is a load operation after the loading the value let us say the value red is 20. So, you have an address that you are mentioning so 1000 means the address so if it is a load operation the meaning is I have to read a value of location 1000 let us say the value is 20 so 20 will come here. If it is a store operation to be done on 1000, then I will tell write the value 10 into the location 1000. So, this is the meaning of it. So, if you look at there exists a difference in which a read and a write is being carried out. So, sequential execution means all operations are ordered. What do you mean by legal sequential execution? Every read operation returns the value of the latest write operation to the same address. So, consider the case that you have a variable a, first I perform a write on it followed by a read, again I am going to read the value of a, then I write on a, again two times I am reading one after another, again I am writing on a and then reading. So, what this legal sequential execution means? Every read operation returns the value of the latest write operation. So, this particular read operation upon execution it should return the value that was written by this write. Similarly, this read also should return this write value. Here you can see one more time write happened. So, hereafter until the next write all read operation should reflect upon the value that is been written. Similarly, the last read should get the value that is been written by the write just before that. So, that is known as a legal sequential execution. So, the observer sitting on a memory location need to observe a legal sequential execution. So, in the previous diagram that we have seen, let us say you have a cache memory and somebody is going to observe, he need to know a legal a sequential execution. That means, any write that has happened, thereafter if at all there is any read that is going to be there, the read should get the latest return value. That is what is meant by the legal sequential execution. So, now you think of an observer sitting on a core. So, till now the observer was sitting on a cache, now your observer is sitting on a core. Now, in the case of a load operation, we know that you are going to give an address, the address is going to the memory, the value is read from the memory and it reaches the processor. So, the point of reading the value from memory is called time for computation and then thereafter the loads value or the address is being removed from the appropriate load queue. But in the case of a store operation, you give the request for store, sometimes it is possible that processor from the processor side the store is over, but the actual store is not fully reflected at that point. How is it possible? We have already learned about reorder buffer in the out of order sequential execution. 
Now, in the reorder buffer, the moment the entry leaves the reorder buffer, it may be going to a storing buffer. As far as the processor is concerned, the store is over. So, let us say this is your reorder buffer and your processor is going to put up something. I have to perform a store operation on location A. Let us say x is the value. So, I need to write a value x into the location A and then I put up into the store queue or store buffer. The moment the value, the address and the value is placed in the store buffer, the operation is completed as far as the processor is concerned. So, that is what is called T end. So, you start a store operation, the moment the value is put into the store buffer or it comes out of a reorder buffer, that is why it is called reorder buffer out, it is considered as over as far as processor is concerned. But it may take some time in the store buffer to really reach to the memory location, finding out A and then writing X. Only at that time we can tell that the T completion occurs. And sometimes we also learned about an optimization, something called write buffer. When you work with a write through cache and when you wanted to write into the next level, into the main memory and then if you wanted to save the space, you write into the cache and then you put a value into the write buffer. It may take some more cycles to, be get, to, to get this write reflected on the main memory. So, putting into write buffer is as good as return into the main memory. So, in this case, the moment you put into the write buffer, your T end happens. The way in which you start initiating a process to fill up an entry into the write buffer, there you have the T start. The moment the value is put into the write buffer, that is your T end. After that only the value has been taken from write buffer and then it has been put into. Then that can be considered as the T completion. So, the actual store operation may be sometimes outside the T end window, but as far as the load is concerned, your T computation or T completion always is in between T start and T end because you initiate the process, it will go to the memory. The moment it read, that is called time of completion of the memory operation and then you return that is called the time of ending. In the case of a store, you initiate a process, actual completion, actual task may be carrying out at a much more later stage due to the optimization that has been done. So, any entry that has been coming out, any store entry that is coming out of a reorder buffer, it may be a T end. Sometimes if you put it in the right buffer, that may be a T end, but the actual storing can be sometimes defined. This creates a small challenge as far as how an observer views a load and then a store. Because of this inherent time delay, there can be some problem associated with the execution unless we are not taking the right remedy to address that. Let me now bring your attention into a parallel execution scenario. I am going to introduce two terms. Term number 1, Rx1 means read the value of x as 1 and Wy2 means set the value of y to 2. I am going to talk about three threads, thread 1, thread 2 and thread 3 and each one of them have some operation that is been associated. And then this is the activity in which you do. So, you can see that this is the T start, this is the T end and wherever you see this blue bar that is the completion time. So, first operation that has been happening is given like this, thread 2 is going to perform an operation, it is called Rx0. So, read the value of x as 0 that is known as the first operation and what is second operation? Write the value of x to 1 that is second operation where you can see that the completion time of event 2 is after event 1 and hereafter we have the third one that has been coming. So, this is the third one. So, what is happening here? Rx1 read the value of x as 1. So, if you look at the overall timeline, your first operation is Rx0, second operation is Wx1, third operation is Rx1. Now, if you go to the fourth operation that is done by thread 3, you are telling write a value of 1 into y. So, this is the, uh, the time at which you initiate this write process, actual write happens here and this is the time at which you end the write process. But if you look at the fifth operation part of thread 2, you can see that the actual completion happens outside the start and end window, some because of some optimization, optimization using write buffer and all. 
So, the real reflection of the value happens only at this point. What am I trying to do? Here I write the value of y equal to 1, whereas thread 2 now make the value of y equal to 2. And then you write the value of x equal to 3 here. So, that has been done and later you are going to perform a read operation. So, r y 2. So, this is the point in which you perform a read operation. So, what you look at down? You are telling what is the order in which all these operations happen. Timeline shows the order of completion of these events. But then if you look at the order of completion of uh, these events, you can see that this completes, this is the completion time. The ending time, in the case of an ending time, 2 ends before 3 this is your 3 and 2 ends before 1 also that is the order in which. So, even though the actual process to initiate writing of x equal to 1 that started first, but actual reflection of x equal to 1 before that somebody actually read the value of x that has been there. So, we will be able to know that first the value of x is being read as r x 0, then somebody has written the value of x, then a third person is going to read the value of x. So, if you look at the sequence, thread 2 initially will read the value of x as 0, thereafter it is being replaced with 1 by thread 2. So, when thread 3 reads, it should read this 1, not this 0, that is what is our intention. As we proceed further, we can see that thread 4 is going to write a value. So, all these things are going to deal with x only. Now, we are going to talk about the scenario where y is manipulated. So, first I write the value of y equal to 1. Thereafter, someone else overwrite y. So, y was initially 1. At this point, y will become 2. And then, somebody is going to write on x. So, x is now become 3. But if you look at if somebody is trying to read the value of y, they should look backwards and then see what was the latest y on y. So, it should be actually this value of y that has to be there. That is why you are telling somebody making y equal to 2 and I am able to read the same y. <coughs> so, this is a representation by which you can see that even though your threads are running parallelly, they have their own execution window, they have their own order in which this happens. If you look at ultimately on a timeline axis, there exists an order, a sequential order in which these memory operations are being carried out. So, what do you mean by an execution equivalence? Execution equivalence means consider some parallel execution. For all this parallel execution, we can come up with a sequential timeline. So, consider the case that this one, this one represents an activity, it is a reading activity by thread 2 and this happens in timeline. So, I am telling 1 dash is the sequential equivalent of 1. Similarly, 2 dash is another sequential execution of sequential equivalent of 2, 3 dash is the sequential execution. So, here I am not really bothered about the exact timing. If you look at the exact timing, these are the points at which your 1, 2 and 3 should happen, but I am not really bothered about the actual time is not relevant, only the order is important. What I am telling is 1 dash should happen before 2 dash, it should happen before 3 dash. Similarly, 3 dash should happen before 4 dash, which in turn should happen before 5 dash, before 6 dash and before 7 dash and 7 and 7 dash. So, this is your 7 and then 7 dash is the equivalent sequential pattern that is going to be there. So, what we demand from here is the ordering within the thread is important. So, if you look at two activities that are part of thread 1, you have a memory operation defined by 2 and another memory operation defined by 6. They both are part of the same thread. The thread say that 2 should happen before 6. So, I have to ensure that every time thread 1 is executed, the operation 2 should be before 6. Similarly, if you take thread 2, operation 1 should be before operation 5. If you take thread 3, operation 3 should be before 4, which in turn should be before 7. 
So, this is the ordering within the thread and there should be ordering across the thread also. That is what you see ultimately the ordering across the thread is 1 followed by 2 followed by 3 then 4, 5 and 6. So, for every thread that has been happening every memory activity there is a sequential equivalent for this. So, once we are able to get a sequential equivalent for a program and if everybody agrees to the sequential ex equivalence, then our execution won't will be correct. There won't be any inconsistency or an error that is going to be associated with this. So, what is known as ordering of operations? Let us say we have operations A, B, C and D. In what order should the hardware execute these operations? So, if these are all, when this A, B, C, D are memory operations, some are load, some are store, the hardware will execute this in the corresponding memory and then hardware will report back the result also. So, there should be a contract between the programmer and the micro architect because the programmer really want an expected order of instruction. As per his program, he want A to be done and thereafter only B should run like that. So, that is the expected order. And then the pre preserving this expected order is what the hardware engineer should do. So, hardware engineer may come up with better techniques to improve efficiency something like having load store queue, sometimes you may have parallel execution units, sometimes you may have out of order execution unit. So, consider the case that you have this four instruction A, B, C and D. The programmer wants this is the order in which this instruction execute because he assumed that first you do A followed by B followed by C and D. But we have seen in instruction pipeline and in cache memories, we can come up with improvement efficient techniques, something like having a load store queue. So, without completion of this operation, I can dump the values in the load store queue and go ahead with the next instruction. So, I will start execution of B before even A is not complete. Sometimes, if B and C can be parallelly done, for example, if you have the sufficient functional unit available. Sometimes I may run D before B, out of order execution is possible in order to improve efficiency. So, hardware designer may be doing number of optimization steps in order to get performance. But he has to always remember that in all this process, whatever he do, any optimization that you are going to do, ultimately whatever is the expected output for a programmer, whatever is the sequential order that the programmer ex expect that has to be preserved whatever optimizations that you do. So, when you run multiple program and the programmer has different program that has been there and when these programs are going to run in a multiprocessor scenario, the optimizations that you do, the interconnection mechanism that exists between them, the optimizations in the cache, none of them should be a deterrent as far as the expected outcome that is the programmer wants. So, we are now coming on to the concept of sequential consistency. So, when we can tell that a parallel execution is equivalent to some sequential execution, when a parallel execution is equivalent to a legal sequential execution and the order of operation in the sequential execution is as per the program order, we say that the execution is sequentially consistent. So, when a parallel execution is equivalent to a legal sequential execution, then the order of operations in the sequential execution is as per the program order. So, anything that you do, the order of operation should be as per the program order. So, we can interleave the execution of different threads, there is no problem as far as a multiprocessing environment is concerned, but they have to be arranged sequentially. Every read receives the value of the latest write. So, anything that I write, anybody who is reading from that point onwards, whatever I have written, that value should be supplied to all the subsequent reads. And for each thread, the operations are arranged in the program order. So, any writing that happens, any read that follows immediately after that, be it in that processor or be it in another processor, whatever that you have written, from that point onwards, every read should get the latest value that you have written, irrespective of the place the processor runs. So, it can be the same. Sometimes you may have to travel through a bus and then you have to reach. Ensuring this is a challenge and that is what we are going to learn in the subsequent weeks. So, what do you mean by consistency and coherence? 
Consistency is about ordering of all memory operations from different processors to all memory locations. That is called global ordering of access to memory locations is known as consistency. Coherence is about ordering of operations from different processor to the same memory location. So, local ordering of access to each cache block is known as a coherence. So, consistency and coherence are two terms that are used more or less in the similar context. But it is very important to understand the difference between them. Let me try to put it in a much more simpler way. Consistency means you have many processors, 1, 2, 3, many processors are there and then you have memory locations which is a shared memory location wherein all these processors can access. So, P1 may access A, P2 may access B, C like that. So, if you look at in totality, there should be a global ordering of access to all the memory locations. That is what is known as consistency. It is about ordering of all memory operations from different processors in spite of the fact that they may be to different one. So, P1 writes on A, P1 writes on B, P2 writes on C, P3 writes on A like that. That is going to be the order. So, multiple processors, multiple memory locations and mentioning a global order for that, that is consistency. Now, coherence is a subset. Multiple processors, I am interested in talking about one location, one shared location. P1 writes to X, P2 writes to X, P3 read from X. So, local ordering of access to one location, one shared location in a cache block, that is what is known as a coherence. So, coherence is all about ordering operations from different processors into the same location. So, when there is a global ordering of all processors to all locations, that is consistency. When there is a local ordering, so I am only interested in what my memory location is, there can be many processors, this local ordering from all the processors into the same cache and that is what is known as coherence. So, there are two important axioms for coherence. One is known as write serialization. Write to the same location how to be globally ordered. So, when you write, then they have to be globally ordered. Second one is write propagation. A write which happens on a memory location done by any processor should eventually be seen by all the threads. That is also very important. So, write serialization tells that writes to same location there has to be a serial order. It is a global order. Everybody should see the same serial order. Write propagation means everybody should see that. A write should be seen by all. That is called you propagate the effect of write everywhere and then you have a serialization of the writes that is being done. So, this is basically two axioms of uh, coherence that we have to be there. So, before conclusion, we have today talked about a different paradigm whenever we have a multiprocessor scenario there can be multiple of them running together and they may be accessing memory location, preserving a global sequential order, we have seen that. Now, towards the end, we have learned about coherence, what is the difference between consistency and coherence and two important axioms of coherence. One is about serialization of writes, second one is propagation of writes. With this background, now we will learn about cache coherence protocols. There First way, we are going to talk about snoop based protocols and then we talk about directory based protocols and together with that, with the multiprocessing environment, we will be in a position to clearly understand whenever multiple process try to access the same memory locations, how do you ensure correctness in the program execution. So, with this, we conclude today's session. Thank you.